All right, hey everyone. I think we're uh, I think we're live here. How you doing on this Wednesday night? Hope you're doing well. I'm having a pretty good day. Good to good to see you here. I see uh, Jeff in the chat. Jeffrey Westlock. Good to see you. If you're just tuning in, let me know that you're here. Uh, I can see you in the chat, and you should show up up here in the top hand corner. Actually, let me just make sure that the chat's coming through on this screen. And just so I can see you more easily, let's take a look. Today we're going to take a look at a bunch of different things. Um, sometimes I spend the evenings here at my uh, place in my office here, uh, taking a look at uh, like what's going on, right? Um, however, uh, most of the time you're not here doing it with me. And, and I think that's the idea of this stream. Hey, good to see you, uh, EMV from uh, the KW area. Kitchener Waterloo, good to see you. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through a bunch of different stories that are going on right now um, and, and talk about them and uh, hope to be uh, pretty engaged with the people here in the chat. Uh, and if there's anything that you want me to check out, maybe there's something that I haven't made a video about or there's something that you're interested in that uh, I m might not know about, right? Like a lot of news doesn't hit my feed. This is a good time to sort of bring it up and we'll, we'll chat about it here on the channel. We'll watch some videos together, check out some uh, articles and uh, do it all here together. I'm probably gonna grab a beer in a little bit and just hang out. So a little bit of a more laid back stream than what we've done before here on the channel. But um, even if it's a smaller amount of people here joining us, uh, it's great to get to know you and, and uh, to hang out for a little bit. Yeah, I see a Hexy Richard Hart versus the SEC. I could check that out. Uh, Glenn L. Stratford, crypto pumping. Yeah, crypto's uh, uh, pumping today for sure. I think like Ethereum's up like 10%. Bitcoin's around the same, uh, largely off of the, um, the ETF sort of speculation and sort of soft news. Great to see a Jim and Brewman, and, but Arb, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Glenn, Jordany. By Arb, yeah, Arbitrum. Okay, I like that too. A little bit of an ETH L2. Good to see you over here. Bell, uh, awesome. We got people tuning in. I wanted to start with a little story that happened like maybe not quite a week ago, probably about four days ago. And it, I think a lot of people called it the the worst take, uh, like in terms of like an opinion or or a post or or something that from a politician for the year of 2024, and it already happened. Um, already happened in like the first week and it's from elizabeth may actually let me pull up um if you don't know i use epic pen to um to annotate the screen and to, to check things out so we're going to pull that up so i can draw around and it's from uh, elizabeth may uh leader of the green party wasn't for a while and then now is leader of the green party again and She's saying, memo to Pierre Polyev, you need to redo your housing hell video in light of Economist magazine, finding that the most livable and cheapest cities in North America are in Canada. Okay, so so seeing that, most livable and cheapest cities in North America are in Canada, a lot of people are going to say like, okay, I thought that Canada had like one of the, the biggest housing issues uh, going, right? Um, so that immediately made a lot of people do a double take. But what she's saying here, she's saying, okay, this study, uh, and I have it up in another tab here, is looking at the most and least expensive cities in North America to live in. And it looks like, okay, Toronto's like lower on the list than maybe New York and some places out in California. Interesting. Uh, we got people sort of saying this is a <laughs> this is a bad take. All of these all of these sort of headlines about um, this just not making sense, right? So what's going on here? Uh Let's take a look. This is the uh, this is what she's talking about, right? This is the global livability index. Let me zoom in there so you can see it, okay? And also, I'm I'm taking a look at a ch at the chat. Uh, if anyone, um, we got Jim from Wallaceburg, we got Bella and Gary and Amin and Shalom and and Bruman and Chris and Lucy. Hey, uh, yeah, good. Uh, Good to see you all here and hang out with you. And if there's anything that I can do to change the screen or make it a little bit more uh, view, viewer friendly, let me know. I'll, I'll edit that stuff in. Yeah, so it's saying, okay, what are the most affordable cities? Um, this is the Global Livability Index. And Elizabeth May was saying, okay, look at how awesome this is. Well, we got three of Canada's major cities in here as some of the most livable cities. We've got Vancouver, Canada. We've got Toronto, Canada in here as one of the most livable uh, cities, as well as Calgary here, most livable city um, in terms of stability, healthcare, culture, environment, education, and infrastructure. I could see, I could see a lot of those um, 
being good in these cities, right? In Canada, generally pretty stable. The healthcare is good, culture, environment, okay, education, infrastructure. But th you'll notice there's one thing that's like missing from this list, <laughs> and that's housing. Um, yeah, so Brewman, you're onto something here. You're, Brewman says, is that including house prices? Is that including house prices? Well, that's what the, I think Elizabeth May didn't realize because uh, this affordability index, even though she's saying, okay, take a closer look at, uh, at your housing hell video, Polyev, if you haven't seen that, we watched it on the channel a little while ago on a live stream, um, this sort of documentary content talking about the state of the country from the conservative leader. Uh, she's saying, take another look at that because this says that everything's all good, even though this doesn't actually include housing, which I think that uh, was a little bit of a blunder, right? Uh, we got Trevor Tome here, who is a, uh, a a pretty good journalist here. Um, here's this on Twitter. Important context, the EIU's World Cost of Living Index does not include home prices, mortgage page payments, or even rent. So some of the most expensive things, right? Home prices, mortgage payments, even rent, all of the housing related things are not in here. So he's saying, okay, it's a useful survey, but not for housing, even though the whole point of her sort of attack here against Pierre Polyev is that, hey, you got to redo your housing video because uh, it's not true. Or at least that's what she's making it sound like, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, what do you guys think about that? We've got people saying, could you talk a little bit about UBI? I can talk about that uh, in a second here. I'm in Caledon, nice. Tell us about UBI. I appreciate the channel, Russ. Jonah, nice to see you tuning in. When are we talking about the BTC ETF? We can talk about that because there was a lot of drama um, with uh, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, and, um, and and what was happening on Twitter there. ETF priced in. My rental in Toronto is two four fifty for a bedroom from Daniel. Yeah, well, well, let's, let's check out some of that stuff. Um, but first... I, and I, I think that I recommend you grab something that you can sort of chill here with me, whether that's uh, maybe you want an evening coffee, maybe a little bit of dessert, a treat of some sort. I'm going to go grab a beer and just hang out and we're going to talk talk about Canada and uh, sort of just shoot the shit a little bit more than we do in the videos and answer questions, all that sort of stuff. So be right back. I'll see you in a minute. Here we go. Drinking gin, nice brew, man. Okay, so a couple of different things. Uh, JP Weiser's on ice, I like that too. Beautiful, yeah. Okay, so I've got a couple of topics on um, on the list here that you, it seems like you guys are pretty interested in, in chatting about. We've got the BTC ETF. Have you guys heard of that? What's going on there uh, in terms of uh, crypto? Oh, SEC approved 11 Bitcoin ETFs. Did that actually come through Cold Mountain? Is that, uh, oh, someone's asking what I'm drinking. It's one of my favorites. It's, not, it's pretty basic, but a, a cream or a lager. Not sponsored, but one of my favorites, personally. Yeah, okay, so we got a couple topics. Some people saying, let's talk about UBI. Let's talk about um, ETFs. I, okay, so it sounds like the ETFs are the news of the night. I started this stream without even knowing that it was, uh, that it was approved. Uh, I want to check something. Can anyone, like, if you find a news article online, maybe on your computer or your phone or something like that, can you drop that in the chat for these YouTube streams? I don't know. Maybe, like, I'm wondering if it, like, if it blocks. Um, like, does it block links? But, like, can you drop me links through there so I can find things that you guys are checking out? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. If not, we'll figure out another option there. Maybe like through uh, Discord or something like that to send links. But let's check out this um, BTC ETF because I don't know the details of this. It seems like the SEC has approved it. News. Whoa. Wow, 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 wow. I didn't realize that it was this far along. This far along, wow. Okay, 
Also, let me know, like, it, I, um, do you like having the chat up in the top corner there when we're on this view? Sometimes it blocks stuff out a little bit. Let me know what you think. But yeah, this is big. Okay. Yeah, you were right, Mad World. Yeah, it got approved. Uh, SEC officially approves Bitcoin ETFs. Trading starts tomorrow. Okay, well, like off of that headline, let's see um, BTC price. Uh, okay, so looks like it's down today, which is interesting. Um, despite, I, I kind of like coin market cap the most for charts. Okay, so maybe maybe Google's not completely up to date. Up 1.44% in one day, which for crypto is kind of um, baby steps in terms of how crazy things go. Um, but uh, okay. And I know that some other ones are ripping too. Like maybe this is a sell the news event. Have you heard that saying? Um, uh, buy, yeah, yeah. Sell, what is it? Buy, sell the news. What is that saying? I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. But the idea of like, okay, now that it's happened, all the speculation leading up to it, now you sell to try to get the, buy, there it is, Jonathan, buy the rumor, sell the news. Yeah, I, I just blanked on it. You're, you're totally right. Okay, so let's, let's check this out a little more closely. Uh, SEC officially approves Bitcoin ETFs. Trading starts tomorrow. So if you don't know, the, like the reason this is a big deal is because it makes it so that you can own uh, BTC, which is Bitcoin, if you're uh, into crypto, you can own it without having to own it in a self-custody way where you actually have private keys and you're, you're actually managing that yourself and uh, securing that yourself. Uh, of course, you can hold things on exchanges, but exchanges sometimes can go under and then like, what are your funds doing if they're sort of tracked, trapped in there? Um, but the nice thing about this is that, okay, ETFs are very heavily regulated. And another big benefit is that you can hold them in your... Um, you can hold them in your tax advantaged accounts like TFSAs, RRSPs, or if you're in the States, like your Roth IRAs and your IRAs, things like that. So that's why this is a big deal, right? Because it means that a lot of people that wouldn't have exposure to to, to crypto in general might feel a little bit more comfortable with this. Um, maybe it'll start trading amongst larger financial institutions. A lot of people have been saying this is a narrative that might drive up uh, the uh, Bitcoin uh, prices. So interesting to see that this is being approved. Let, let's let's dig into it a little bit more. I'm seeing some more people saying no chat in the top right-hand corner. So I'm going to drop that when we're on this. Oh, that's me. That's me. Not the chat. <laughs> drop the YouTube chat so that you can see. It will be here when we're in this view, and it won't be here or in this view. I like it. Okay. Pooner says the two-factor authentication talk on Bloomberg was hilarious today. We're talking about crypto. Uh, like, and, and just like not explaining self-custody, right? Okay, so let's get into it. The SEC Exchange Commission late Wednesday finally approved a slew of spot Bitcoin ETFs, so it was multiple, following months of anticipation. The news comes hours after the Chicago Board Options Exchange approved all six of its BTF ETF, BTF, BTC ETF uh, applications. And trading is going to start already tomorrow. That's very fast. The SEC gave the green light to 11 issuers that applied for Bitcoin exchange traded funds. In the first wave of approvals, oh, from ARK. Okay, that's Kathy Wood's fund, BlackRock, Van Eck, Fidelity. Interesting to see all these big names sort of get into, um, oh, volume too low. Yeah, let me pump that a little bit for you. How is that? Hopefully that's a little bit better. Interesting to see these big banks getting into, big banks, big funds, things like that, getting into the crypto space. The approval means the Bitcoin ETFs could start trading as early as tomorrow. Uh, excitement's running high. Many people think the, B the Bitcoin ETS will draw a flood of institutional investment. So this is what uh, everyone like who who has uh, exposure to um, to crypto is kind of thinking. Okay, well, like maybe this brings in a lot more capital into the space and drives up prices. Um, but maybe people have already bought, predicting that, and more people will sell now than what they're buying. But Brewman says, BlackRock is buying 2 million in Bitcoin tomorrow. Layer in Bitcoin having about 3.4, 3 to 4 months. I mean, this kind of all does line up with interest rates coming down, right? Which makes you think that it's like bull market. Uh, yeah, billion. Like a, the bull market vibes, right? Where, where crypto rips again and maybe even equities rip again uh, if we actually see the central banks of the world cutting rates. 
Meanwhile, the issuers disclosed their planned management fees for the ETFs in their updated regulatory filings on January 9th and 10th, which ranged from 0.2% to 1.5%. Okay, so there are fees. They're not very low. Like, they're not very low fees. Like, you would like to see a 0.05 or something like that if you're, like, an exchange-traded ETF, uh, index ETFs, right? Lower management fees. 1.5%. Okay. That's quite a lot. Quite a lot of people getting into this. iShares, Bitcoin Trust. Okay, so then, okay. Yeah, okay. A little bit of up and down for the Bitcoin price. Um, yeah, Kathy Wood expected some profit taking on the ETF news. That's what I was saying. Um, buy the rumor, sell the news. Yeah, and there was this weird false announcement where the SEC sort of put it out too early, like a couple days ahead of time, which is wild. Which is wild. Yeah, they're not, yeah, Pooter, you're right. There's not, it's not horrible management fees, like all things considered, compared to some mutual funds that I've seen. Okay, that's interesting. So the Bitcoin price has ripped, but now, like, the, now what the buy the rumor is instead of it being the buy the buy the news of the bit or sell the news of bitcoin is buy the rumor of okay if bitcoin gets an etf in the states well then maybe maybe uh, eth uh, is the next bet right it's the only other crypto that i think the sec has said okay it's not a security right it's not a token it's not an unregistered security that's being traded so that's pretty wild um so let's see what how Ethereum market price today. Okay, this has ripped quite a lot more than uh, Bitcoin has. So maybe I'm right about that, that um, that we're seeing this this rip because of that, right? Buying the buying the new, or, oh my gosh, how come I can't get that, uh, <laughs> can't get that phrase into my head? Buy the rumor, sell the news. So that's pretty wild that that's happening. I will check in on that throughout the night. Let me, uh, Take a look at chat here and see see what's going on. Hey, good to see you, Candice. A long time no talk. Mountain Finance, a, a great YouTube channel. Hi, Russell. So glad to so glad the US spot Bitcoin ETF is finally in the book. Yeah, and that's a big deal that it's spot also, right? Like they've had futures. Um Futures ETFs, but if with futures ETFs, there's the people who are uh, managing those those ETFs don't actually have to own the the asset. Um, but whereas it, if it's spot, as the uh, as those ETFs are bought up, if I'm not mistaken, um, more Bitcoin has to be purchased, or it's more on a one to one direct ratio. Is that right? Maybe I'm confusing it a little bit, but essentially people think that the spot ETFs are going to have more of a uh, more of a impact on price yeah rock the casbah says nice to be on a stream with you dude been really appreciating your videos i'm glad you've been checking them out hopefully i'll be able to have more time this year uh to do streams like this where we can kind of just chill have a drink or something like that and hang out because uh, like my videos throughout the weeks are pretty produced right or, or rather like i do have to do a fair amount of research for them but it's nice to to come back in and uh, just do a stream where there's relatively little planned right like i've got a couple things that we can talk about but i want it to be directed by what you guys are into and what you're currently checking out okay so that's big news btc etf approved 11 of them by the sec wow okay we were talking about this uh elizabeth may's bad take before i went and grabbed a beer and we talked about crypto for a little bit um a couple of other things that we can check out uh let me see. Okay, actually, we, we were talking about UBI. Maybe I can do a little bit of a take on that first before we get too heavily into it. We've got uh, Marco saying, let us know before we go live. Yeah, this one was a short-term notice, less planned one. Daryl's saying, hey, Russell, man, was looking out for a video. I've been hearing about the Universal Basic Income 2000. Have you heard of this? And what do you think that can affect the economy? How, how is that going to impact things? Um. Yeah, so we've talked about UBI on the channel a bunch before. We followed it even like last liberal convention, the uh, liberal government uh, or the 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 uh, the gathering of all of the registered liberals. They voted on what what should our policy goals be, and two of those said, "Hey, the majority of us want uh, UBI to be at least taken more seriously." But it seems like the uh, the the current liberal government isn't really in favor of that right like it, 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 remind me maybe daryl is it um 
is it like the rumor is the rumor that it's like the liberal government wants to implement it? Because I always thought that they, given how they talk about the economy right now, like we need to be fiscally prudent and they're really trying to like counteract the conservatives and how they sort of are seen as the more serious economic um, uh, party. Like, I was, I'd be surprised to see if the liberals were, were doing that or talking about that right now. I know there was one senator earlier, UBI News Canada. Let me see. Yeah, nothing really since since that policy convention. Advocates take their case for a guaranteed basic income to the Senate. There, there was talk in the Senate of like what what could that look like. See, like it's so hard to talk about um, talk about UBI without really knowing. What are the ins and outs of it? How does it work? Does it in some, like, like there's tons of arguments on either side, right? Like, will that provide a base level for people so that they can go out and be more productive and, and create businesses and have this sort of set amount uh, of money that they get each month? But at the same time, if everybody gets that same amount of money, well, are you really doing anything then, right? Because you're kind of just like, it's like that uh, Incredibles quote. I don't know if you ever watched The Incredibles, but if everyone's super, nobody is. Like if, if if something happens to everybody, then it's just the same of it as it not happening to anyone. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I'm I'm interested in that though. Like, what would the impact be? The one thing that I am I do get concern, concerned about about UBI is that okay. If a government gives you a set amount of money and you become dependent on that, is that subjecting yourself to more ability to be controlled by a government through threat of uh, removing whatever sort of funding that they give you, right? Even if you you love the liberal government or love any government and they give you UBI and you trust them to, to not uh, unjustifiably take away your funding, even if you trust the current government, you don't know what government's going to come in the future and what they could use or how they could abuse that, right? So that's what that's where I get concerned about it. That's that's my take on it. Um, so that's pretty wild. Uh, yeah, but I don't I don't see it very likely as happening, honestly. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's much sentiment behind it from the liberals, uh, and the conservatives definitely wouldn't be caught dead talking about that uh, based on what I know about them. So that's wild. A couple of people were asking in the chat, how, uh, what do I think about this Elizabeth May take? I just think it's a, I think it's a bad take, right? Like, I think it's just, she may, she saw a headline, didn't think about it too much. Um, didn't realize that she's saying, Hey, this tells you that housing is just fine in Canada. Everything's livable and cheap. Um, even though housing isn't included in what she's looking at. doesn't really make a lot of sense. Carla, what do you mean? Technically, wouldn't UBI divert funding away from government? I don't know how they would agree to that. What do you mean in terms of divert funding away from the government? Like, it'd be, it would be operated by the government, and they would pay for it, right? So, I get, like, they would pay for it. Of course, it's, like, our tax dollars, right? To a certain extent, and a certain extent, the government taking on debt. Um What's going on with the disability benefit? I think it's just Mr. Wallace. I think it's just locked up, locked up in the in the political process. Like I said, this when Carla Qualtrough was pushing through the uh, the the, uh, the the disability benefit legislation, there was no information about what the benefit was inside that legislation. It was just saying, "Hey, we have to talk about it now and figure it out with consultations over the next years." I think it's going to be something, unfortunately, that's held over people's heads and uh, come the election time and say, "Hey." Like, we've been working on this so hard, even though they haven't been doing shit. Uh, and, and say, like, hey, if you vote conservative, well, then you're not going to get this disability benefit. It's not a policy goal, it seems like, right now um, for, for the liberals, which is unfortunate. Because I think out of the people that most deserve and need um, financial support, that would be pretty high up there on the list. But doesn't seem like, uh, maybe that doesn't uh, result in enough votes to make it uh, worth the the cost of people saying you're unfiscally prudent, at least in their eyes. I don't know. So I think that's interesting. Yeah, do I still get UBI if I make $100,000? That's the difference, right? Be between a guaranteed livable income, a GLI, and a UBI, a universal basic income. Universal makes it sound like everyone's going to get the same thing, but if it's income tested, 
then that's a different different can of worms, right? I'm wary of UBI Canada needs to increase productivity per capita. I'm not sure this would help. Yeah, like there's there's arguments that say, okay, this will actually make Canada more productive because the people will feel like they have a more of a social safety net and take more career and business risks. I'm not sure about that. Like I, I I'm like I think Canada doesn't very well incentivize people to go out and try to make more money, to build their own businesses. Uh, like the tax environment doesn't make it feel like that, right? As soon as you sort of hit a threshold, you have to work marginally twice as hard to add more to your income because you're taxed at 40% or, or whatever. So that's pretty wild. Okay, a couple of other things that we can take a look at here. Uh, actually, I wanted to listen in on something because I saw a uh, a YouTube video that just popped up today from BNM Bloomberg. Bank of Canada needs to push back to deter borrowers from jumping back into the mortgage market. That's the headline. Um, I'm getting my thoughts are like probably they're going to talk about okay, everyone's speculating now that rates are just going to come down, uh, and maybe people are rushing into the uh, real estate market now again and could cause more of a uh, real estate fever if rates come down, right? But it seems like maybe people are trying to preempt that. Uh, let, let's check this out. I see you, uh, Craig, saying, is the current election process in Canada honest or is it compromised? I feel like there's no way to tell and to know for sure. We already know that there's a lot of um, interference from, uh, from other countries when it comes to elections. I don't think that that's disputed. But to the fact, like, is it compromised or like how much it is? It's very hard to hard to know. But yeah, let's 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 watch this and we'll get into some some other stuff in a minute. I can rip on the buckets. Okay, and let's turn up the quality here. Why does this look so bad? Okay. So let's start with how closely you're watching the the tone in the housing market when it comes to the outlook for Canada's economy this year. Yeah, so you know we're clearly at risk of a bit of a melt up here. Um, the fact that uh, global rate expectations fell so much back in November uh, has really sort of bolstered consumer confidence. It has lifted the uh, the appetite for for uh, investing in real estate, and that is leading to a situation in which we actually might see a rebound in the housing market in the early spring um, certainly not a you know something that would blow the doors off but but far better than uh, than many had expected including myself last year and, without doubt <laughs> and, and and so sort of listening to some of the comments from the Canadian bank CEOs uh, I assume if people are, are, are ready to jump into the housing market they have enough savings that they can uh, address not only higher prices but uh, the fact that you know if you're getting a mortgage today it's going to be more costly than it was a few years ago uh, or if you're somebody that's renewing a mortgage obviously your costs are higher or as we mentioned as well you got to consider the taxes on properties as well going up I mean this is this is sounding pretty costly that is, you know, it's kind of interesting too when you think about what the bank CEOs are really telling you, right? They're they're telling you that their loan books are likely to remain relatively stable. Like they're not looking at, you know, having to put aside huge cost provisions for a wave of defaults in in more. That's a big point. That's a big point. They're saying at the uh, there was like a recent meeting between a bunch of the different heads of big banks, and he, they're saying that one of the things that came out with that was saying, hey. Our loan portfolio, all the people that we've lent to, they look pretty steady. They're not projecting a bunch of people defaulting on their mortgages. Now, I, I could have told you that, right, and, and did <laughs> a little little while ago when we saw the implementation of so many mortgage amortization extensions, right, where they just allowed people to stretch out their mortgages for this next term. Maybe it's a three-year period, five-year period on their renewals. If they couldn't, if they couldn't. Uh, make the payments work at the new rate, um, qualify for it. They're allowing people to stretch out the amount of time they have to pay off the loan, the amortization to have lower uh, monthly payments, right? So if if the people who otherwise would have been feeling pain from this real estate uh, interest rate increase aren't feeling any pain, then nobody's going to be needing to list, right? Fewer power of sale situations and not a big glut of supply on the market. That's why like the inventory is incredibly low. And that's why I think prices haven't come down as much uh, throughout this period of high interest rates is because the people who 
otherwise would have needed to sell are extending amortizations, figuring out other ways to keep their properties and not listing, thinking, okay, well, maybe like he's trying to say here, interest rates are going to come down, the housing market's going to rip, and I'm going to be able to sell in the future for more, right? This is what some people are thinking. I could see a lot of people who are have been sitting on the sidelines as terms of, uh, in terms of buyers getting maybe like a one-year, two-year period mortgage at a fixed rate, um, trying to get ahead of the market, right? Buy while prices are a little bit depressed and, and ride that up and then potentially have interest rates lower by the time they, they, they renew. So that's going to be interesting. TD at one point had 5.6 million in shorts piled up. Then they sold the brokerage site to the U.S. Bank, huh? Oh, I remember. I remember seeing that. I remember seeing that. Mortgages. That does not mean that the uh, economy is going to emerge unscathed, right? Uh, they're clearly pointing to a long-term drag on Canadian consumption, right? So households are going to get hit by increasing mortgage mortgage costs this year, but much more next year and the year after. At the same time that they're getting hit by these, you know, higher property costs, or higher property taxes, and other increases in the cost of living. So, you know, at the end of the day, the big issue for the Canadian economy is. Do we underperform as consumers pull back and you know sort of tread more cautiously in the years ahead? I would suspect so, and and that is what is sort of tying into what we see in currency markets and in interest rate markets right now. So for the Bank of Canada itself, and you know they've they've said the fight against inflation is not done. Um, what do they do? What do they do if, if you're getting these indications that consumer spending is slowing down? What happens with interest rates this year? Right. So I think in the near term, they have to push back a little bit. Uh, they know that uh, if they encourage uh, borrowers to go out and, and, you know, sort of jump back into that mortgage market and uh, and sort of spend uh, with, you know, no sort of uh, recognition of what might happen in the future, they know that that could cause an inflationary overheat. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see in the next couple of months a little bit of hawkishness in rhetoric, like, you know, we could see policymakers sort of trying to, to to convince Canadians to be more prudent. However, at the same time, of course, they see the writing on the wall. They they see that you know the economy is slowing, and they are likely to closely match the Federal Reserve in providing accommodation through the latter half of the year. So to close. Yeah, I think that that's that's probably an accurate take, right? I've said, I think the Bank of Canada is kind of. BSing a little bit when they're saying, hey, we set our own independent monetary policy. We're not going to do what the Fed does. Like, I don't see them not lowering rates if the Federal Reserve does. But it seems like the Bank of Canada, at least when they do their speeches, Tiff Macklem, uh, Carolyn Rogers, they they always sound a lot more afraid of inflation coming back than the Federal Reserve does. Like, it seems like the Bank of Canada is so terrified of, of taking their foot off of the break of the economy and having it heat back up and having maybe labor markets have a labor shortage, right? Where maybe wages rise and we hit a wage price spiral, which could be inflationary, as well as more consumer demand pushing prices up, uh, both in real estate and just other products. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do here, but like, what can they do? Like, do we see them sort of branch off from what the Federal Reserve does? Like hit... Hit, hit us with another interest rate increase to stop us from buying more homes. Like that's definitely not what the market expects. Uh, let's see some questions in here. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. I missed a couple. Um, Adam says, bought my first house in Manitoba and some places out there are cheap. It's doable, but in major cities, it's clearly not working with the amount of immigration we have in the current construction rate. Yeah, con current construction rate, right? Not so many homes being started right now. I think that's largely due to interest rates, right? We have... Uh, higher interest rates means the developers can't borrow for as cheaply, which means they have higher costs to build, meaning fewer and fewer projects are actually profitable. So that's interesting. Yeah, alongside the, the number of new Canadians coming in, and um, and that's got to have some sort of impact on things, whether it's more or less, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, 
it's doable, but in major cities, it's clearly not working. The math doesn't math. And he says, doesn't this guy, I think referring to me, own multiple properties? What's been your experience, Russell? Are you are you thinking of deleveraging or are you making loads of money off your short-term rentals? I actually have the house that I live in and I uh, it's like a two unit place. So I do an Airbnb in the basement to help make uh, make ends meet, you know, and I uh, part-time cleaning person. <laughs> like I'll go down there and do the cleaning myself just to make an extra a few bucks. So I'm don't have a, a, a huge, huge book of real estate. Uh, but yeah, like, I mean, I could see now if you have cash on hand or if you've been saving and looking for a, looking for a bump in the, in the real estate markets, getting, trying to get ahead of it right now. Like I've thought about that a little bit. Like, can, can I make it work to sort of, uh, end up in a, in a place that maybe has a little bit more space for a family. I'm not married, don't have kids yet, but I, those things probably are, are coming in the not so distant future. So but it, it's crossed my mind. Yeah. Like maybe this is a time to, to try doing that. It's interesting. Closely matched the federal reserve in providing accommodation through the latter half of the year. So, you know, rate cuts could begin within three to six months. Uh, and that is likely to, uh, to you know, relieve some of the pressure on, on households. And I'll, I'll just reiterate what you're saying, which is that that, that that delicate balance for the Bank of Canada, if they start cutting interest rates because there are signs that maybe that is the right thing to do, if people keep jumping into the housing market every time there's an indication of that, that complicates the story. We will watch it. You mentioned the United States and the Fed. We are anticipating some inflation data. Well, we're getting some inflation data tomorrow, but we're going to be watching the market reaction to that. How are you viewing the situation stateside right now? Yeah, so inflation is clearly subsiding uh, in the U.S. and globally. We are expecting to see uh, resilient uh, headline inflation just based on sort of comparables and year-over-year -year effects, but the core inflation print should continue to subside. And, and so that does help to rationalize and justify what we're seeing in markets. Markets are expecting, you know, a rapid and accelerating pace of, of rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. However, uh, what we are uh, sort of looking at in the interim before that inflation print is a speech from John Williams uh, this this afternoon. So that's the New York Fed's John Williams. Uh, when he spoke back in December, he did appear to be pushing back against that sort of unwarranted, premature easing in financial conditions that has occurred as inflation prints have come down. So what we may see is sort of a one-two punch here in, in the sense that he may try to steer markets in a slightly more hawkish direction, try to convince markets that the three rate uh, cuts that are currently priced into the Federal Open Market Committee's uh, curve are more likely to happen than what the markets currently think. The markets are currently priced for five cuts over uh, the course of 2024. So we could see a bit of a convergence between the two. And, and so I would not ignore that speech. I think it, it comes at about 3.20 this afternoon. I think it could be relatively meaningful in terms of setting the stage ahead of tomorrow's inflation print. Okay, we'll watch that closely. It'd be cool if the Fed's John Williams took the music from the composer John Williams, like a Star Wars theme, and uh, and used that as the backdrop to just spice up some of this monetary policy speak. Um, since, uh, since you watch the currency market and the market has obviously been see a couple of questions here. Uh, big housing or, or statements. John says big housing issue is the long process to get things approved from municipal approval, zoning. It takes near a decade to get some multi-unit started. Haven't heard that being fixed more. Yeah. It's definitely a problem, right? A lot of NIMBY, not in my backyardism. Uh, a lot of people sort of, okay, you put up the sign that you're going to build something and then you have 30 different neighbors come, neighbors come to a city council meeting and it's just kind of a shit show. Um, so yeah, that, that's an issue. One thing That is one thing that the liberals I was impressed by was this uh, their plan to bring back the wartime housing sort of strategy um, where they have a number of different uh, pre-approved designs that ideally they can push through approval processes more quickly. Uh, that's something, that's something that seems promising to me. I don't know what impact it's, it's really going to have and how much of an impact it's going to have, but I, I like that idea for that, for that issue. Uh-huh. Glenn says the real reason interest rates are so high is because people can afford the housing. Unemployment is low. Stock markets are at all times high. Life is good. Prices are high. Yeah, maybe like there, there is something to be said there, right? Uh, markets have been doing well. Maybe we are through the most recessionary period that we're going to feel as a result of this. And like maybe 
just maybe the Bank of Canada, the Federal Reserve have done the right thing all along, right? Maybe they have threaded the needle, um, that, or so to speak, right? Like the, okay, we don't want to raise rates so much that we kill the economy and there's no growth at all. But at the same time, we don't want to not raise rates enough and, and inflation stick around for longer. Like there's a chance that they actually just like hit the, hit the nail on the head. But... Yeah, I guess it remains to be seen. We got to see where inflation goes. If I think if we see a big inflate increase in inflation in the next number of months, like the Bank of Canada could walk into the very thing that they're most afraid of, what happened in the 70s and the 80s, where uh, where inflation comes back even though they had they raised rates and then lowered them again, and then inflation surged back, and then they had to raise rates even more to convince people that okay, we're not going to lower rates again. Stop spending. Things, things are going to feel expensive. Let's bring down inflation. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. Sports entertainment, good to see you here again. Uh, do you think UBI will be implemented soon with the rise of AI? That's the area that I do think that maybe there is something to be warranted there. Like, can we usher ourselves into a utopia of abundance through through AI actually doing the work? Like, I saw a comedian, uh, Stavros Halaikis, I think it is. Um, Stavi, love that guy. He made a great point is like, don't you think like when you th 30 years ago, when you thought about like, okay, AI robots taking jobs, it, it's, it's kind of messed up that now AI is largely doing a lot of creative work, like creating music, creating, uh, visuals and art and like, like drawing things. And then we've got people working for minimum wage in an Amazon warehouse factory. Like you, you thought it would be the totally other flip flip side, right? Where robots would do the menial labor. We'd be able to sort of focus on more. Um, focus on more creative endeavors, right? But like, it seems like that's not what's happening. So I wonder, like, are we going to be able to get to a world where like, okay, we're so efficient and, and things are so good in terms of our productivity that we can just kind of sit back, work 10 hour weeks and then focus on our hobbies, creating culture, creating art. I feel like that's wishful thinking. I hope so. I hope so. Colin disagrees with me. Colin says, TIFF hasn't threaded the needle. GDP per capita is down like 4.4% over the last year. And since growth has skewed to the top, the median living standards have dropped by maybe 5%. That's not soft. Uh, fair enough. Like it would be hard to call it a, a, a soft landing for everybody, right? GDP per capita is down, uh, large increase of population, low productivity. Uh, of course, GDP per capita is gonna gonna decrease, which in general is not a great thing so fair enough but i wonder if they've threaded the needle enough that most canadians who aren't paying attention to, to things as closely as a lot of us are maybe maybe they've averted a, a, a major crisis right AI would build the worst houses they'd probably be rooms with no doors thought up yeah or like uh like how they have hands with like nine thumbs John says, I have enough to pay cash for a house in the States, but it's only 10% down in Canada, for real. Uh, shared caregiver wages pay one kid enough to pay a helper to keep out of homes. Interesting. The, the, the larger theme of the last few months, because of this idea of interest rates coming down in the U.S., has weakened the U.S. currency. We saw the Canadian dollar, I want to say, in the 72 cent range uh, coming into November. We got above 75 cents. We've pulled back a little bit. How should we think about the Canadian dollar in, in 2024? Yeah, so it is kind of funny because, uh, you know, if we were to think about this through a John Williams lens, uh, we, we may have seen the crescendo happening pretty early. Uh, the the uh, fact is, like, you know, we you and I spoke about this back in October. Uh, it was expected to happen. We did expect that, you know, that the Fed would start to turn more dovish, that the Canadian dollar would outperform a bit on the back of that. Um, and now we're beginning to sort of uh, flatline. Uh, eventually, I would suspect that we pull back a bit. So right now, in interest rate expectations on both sides of the border are relatively consistent with one another. Uh, they both moved in, in synchrony with each other for uh, almost three months. At some point here, we should see signs of weakness in the Canadian economy growing stronger than they are in the U.S. And, and so that should, uh, you know, put renewed downside pressure on the Canadian dollar. So those gains uh, today, I wouldn't expect them to last all that long. And I would certainly be, uh, I, I want to flag to almost everybody right now that Okay, so it's just more more talk about the dollar. More talk about the dollar. Interesting stuff. Okay, 
for, forgive me right now because I want to check on something that isn't entirely in the niche of the stuff that I talk about on here. Um, maybe I'm going to get demonetized for this. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Screw it. De demonetize me. Okay, we're zero zero. Have you guys been watching this? The uh, the start of the PWHL. Kind of panic in that situation, and they get the puck out of the it. zone. Toronto now has to start over. We're, we're zero zero. I'm gonna check in on this periodically. I probably shouldn't be showing this on screen right now, but I've been following, and it's great hockey. I'm a huge hockey fan for people who don't know. So let me pull that over here. Okay. Apologies, apologies. Let's get serious, folks. Let's get serious. Interesting. Okay, we've got uh, a new Daniel Smith video that seems to be getting a lot oh, of traction. I'm curious what this is. She's obviously very um, anti. Across. Okay, come on, come on, come on. My mouse can't exit full screen. What are we doing here? Equities, uh -huh. FX, commodities, they're way too... I'm losing it. I'm losing it, folks. All right. Is Canada broken? There seems to be a little bit of that talk online. And when you look at the out of control policies coming out of Ottawa right now, it's not hard to see why some might feel that way. As you know, Alberta is a province of innovators and entrepreneurs. It's something we're known for. And we see that innovation and entrepreneurship all throughout our province and economy from agriculture to energy to manufacturing and technology. We are problem solvers, but it's one thing to solve problems as they come up organically. It's another thing when our federal government is creating problems and refusing to focus on solutions. Let's talk about some of these. Electricity regulations that will erode Canada's power grids and put many Canadians in the dark with utility bills they simply cannot afford. Carbon tax exemptions for one part of the country while the rest of the country keeps on paying. Unachievable emissions reductions targets that will simply put chase tens of thousands of good jobs and billions in investment out of the country and out of Alberta. What's even more bizarre, Ottawa wants to ban gasoline vehicles in Canada in favor of electric vehicles. Yeah, I think you're right, John. Daniel Smith does blame the feds for everything. Absolutely everything. But I mean, like, there there are arguments for what she's talking about, right? There are arguments for it. She talked about EVs here, saying all, all cars have to be EVs by the end of the decade. Like, I don't see that really happening. It also gets me frustrated about, like, some of the subsidies for some of these multinational corporations that are saying, hey, we'll manufacture things in Canada if you give us billions of dollars in subsidies and tax breaks. Like, that's something that seems a little bit questionable for me, but... Even though the current infrastructure cannot support this change, and I'm not done yet, just days ago, the federal Liberals launched their latest so-called great idea, a national plastics registry program, so we can register plastic products, a plan that seems to continue their attack against this industry. Quite simply, this is nonsensical. We rely on plastics in the products we use every day from clothing to sporting equipment to vehicle parts, cell phones, and medical equipment. Why does Ottawa think these products are bad? All of these policies and more are designed to hurt everyday Canadians and make life more expensive and more difficult. That, that brings me to one of my biggest gripes of all time, the, the absolute scam that we've all been taken on a loop for uh, at grocery stores, right? Like you used to get all your bags for free, these five cent bags that, and then they, oh yeah, and then they changed it to charging you five cents for, for a grocery bag every time you, you, you come in because we're trying to do our part for the environment and disincentivize. It's not we want to make profits off of a, a, a area of our business where we didn't ever make profits before. It's because we care about the environment. And then now, okay, now we're not even going to sell the bags anymore. You're going to use these 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 reusable bags that you're just going to have to buy for higher prices just as often and are going to end up in a landfill when you have 30 of them anyways. Like, it's like, there's so much uh, environmentalism or uh, corporate profit-seeking that masquerades as environmentalism. Like, like, I think that global warming is real. I think that there's an issue with the climate and maybe we need to be more careful about how we do things for sure. But I think that at the same time as that, um, that opinion um, living in my head, the same opinion sits there that, or at the same time, uh, an opinion sits there that says, okay, what percentage of this is just an excuse to give money to corporations and, and for people to take advantage of something that we feel like, hey, we're helping the planet, we're doing all these good things. Um, but really, it's just in in... in a goal, the goal is just to make more money. 
right? Yeah, sports entertainment, I do the same thing. Keep reusable bags in the car, put my items in the car, bring it to my car. Yeah, that's the move. That's the move for sure. But it just, it just fr is frustrating. We have always been a country and a province that offers opportunity and a good quality of life for those willing to put in the effort. That dream is now gravely in jeopardy because of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Environment Minister, Stephen Guibault. At a time when Albertans and Canadians are still struggling with an affordability crisis, they are pursuing policies that will increase costs and put paychecks at risk. At the beginning of 2024, when we should be looking forward with optimism, we're talking about imploding our economy, banning cars, registering plastics, and paying into the carbon tax instead. Well, not all of us. Alberta is fighting back, and we need to fight back, all because of the dangerous ideas of Minister Stephen Guibault. It doesn't matter that he's been told twice by the Supreme Court and the federal court that his ideas are unconstitutional. The rule of law doesn't seem to slow things down. But all of this could stop right now. We could move away from dangerous ideological policies and instead focus on rational solutions for the future. This includes solutions that will help us achieve a realistic goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. And Alberta's committed to that goal. We have billions of dollars of private investment in new technologies that are geared toward eliminating emissions and creating a better future that includes large investment in Alberta over a decade. Dow's Path to Zero project, the world's first net zero plastics manufacturing facility, and another Alberta first, a new net zero hydrogen plant by Air Products. We have and will continue to invest billions into carbon capture projects and programs. The truth is, Ottawa likes to tell all of us what to do when it comes to emissions reduction. And Minister Guibault has even gone to China to do the same. But it's hypocritical. The truth is, Alberta has met emissions reduction targets, while the federal government has yet to meet a single one of theirs. The truth is, we don't need to destroy our economy to achieve a better future. Alberta continues to prove that and we don't need to work against each other. But as long as Ottawa brings in policies and legislation that hurts Alberta and hurts Canadians, our government will continue to stand up and will continue to fight back. Alberta and Ottawa can have a positive and collaborative relationship, but not with this environment, Minister, and not with these dangerous policies. Albertans can rest assured we will keep on defending the rule of law, the Constitution, the needs of our province, and what's best for you whenever necessary and we will keep on pressing forward in 2024. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm kind of with her on on at least the part about Stephen Guibault. Like, haven't been a big fan of that guy um, since before he was environmental minister, right? He was um, heritage minister just before this, and he was the one that initially, before Pablo Rodriguez got the role, um, brought in a lot of the, uh, the, the sort of bills that... Uh, give the government c more control over content platforms on the internet. Um, some of the, the the news sites in that fight with uh, Facebook and Google and all of that stuff. I, I think that he has been very frustrating in the interviews that I've watched. And I'm not someone who says that about just everyone who is of a certain political party. Um, like I, I'm a fan of, of certain ministers uh, in, the, in the liberal government. I talk all the time about how I like the way that Sean Fraser thinks about things and talks about things. I wonder what he would think and, and talk about if he weren't under the, this current leadership in the liberal party. Like I wonder if maybe he's, he's forced to to say things or think things because he doesn't want to make his bosses look bad. But that's uh, maybe a story for another day. But Gibo, not, not a big fan. Not a big fan. Okay, interesting. Another thing I wanted to take a look at is, um, infer er, talks about the Taiwan election and um, some of the potential um, interference that could be going on there um, and what it could tell us about what's going on in Canada or what could be going on uh, as recently as the last election and the next election, right? Um, the one that's coming up in 2025 at the latest, right? Um, so we can talk about that, but first, do you have uh, anything else that you want to talk about for a second? I'm going to take, take a little pause here. Have a sip. I saw um, uh, someone in chat, and I liked the vibe of it. Um, where is it? I can't find it. Aha, Kevin House. Good to see you. Nothing better than working, solving my coding issues, and listening to Russell Matthews. Great evening for sure. There's something about coding. like That's actually a skill that I've built over the past couple of years is learning how to code largely JavaScript, a little bit of solidity for smart contract blockchain work. 
Um, been doing a lot of that lately and it, there's something so satisfying about coding. It, it almost feels the same feeling that I get like whenever I do any woodworking projects, like a, like I'll build a deck here and there and, and do, do things like that. I get a similar feeling when I complete a coding project as when I complete something physical. It's like you get you get uh, the satisfaction of seeing something that's actually done, something that's actually physical. Um, so great to hear that, Kevin. Hope you're having a good night. John says, general view on why business investment is low in Canada. Is it all tax rates versus the U.S.? Yeah, that, that's a, it's an interesting topic. I'm not really sure. Uh, like, that's the first thing you think of, obviously, right, is okay, what is the, the business tax rate, the corporate tax rate in the country? And people are drawn to places with lower tax rates. So um, that, that's, or yeah, that, that's, that's the first place that everyone thinks of. The other one is like stability. Do you think like, it, it, how likely is it that a government is going to uh, sort of rug pull you, right? You set up a business here and then they increase corporate rates or you set up a business here and now all of a sudden the regulatory environment for the business that you're building isn't as solid. Or maybe it's just the fact that like so much Canadian capital is tied up in real estate so much so that um, that people are less willing or large investors are less willing to invest in Canadian companies um, and actually grow Canadian companies that could help our productivity. That's one thing that I think of. Mango, uh, Russell, which city are you in? I'm in the suburbs just about a uh, half hour east of Toronto, like in the uh, Durham region. Um, yeah, that's where I grew up and then moved to Toronto for a number of years when I went to school and, and then bought a place out back here in the burbs. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people are liking what Smith is saying here. Wish we had her in BC. Thoughts on Codex? But Pooter, I'm not uh, familiar with Codex. Rachel says, how can we fix the future for young Canadians? My partner and I make 260 combined, but are poor now as we don't own real estate. We want kids, but technically can't afford them unless we move rural. I feel you. I feel you. My partner and I feel like we're doing well financially. Like we're we're... Like the money's okay, which is nice. Like we both work hard. But still feel like like okay we can't can't get a place that's the size that we want and more challenging things like that so it's it's tricky how can we fix the future for young Canadians is like do do we go through a painful reset of, of real estate prices or is this gap just going to keep on growing politicians incentivized to pump up the prices of the things that we they own right um, so. Like that's, I wish I had better news to give you, but the way that I think about things is like, I feel like this gap will grow more and more between people who own assets and people who don't over time. I don't see a big revolution happening where a lot of things change. So that's like my personal goal. Like, okay, like work as hard as you can, make as much money as you can, save as much as you can and invest the, that money, the difference in, in assets. Um, I'll of course have an emergency fund, that type of stuff, but invest as much as you can. So maybe you and your family can be on the, the other side of the gap that's growing and growing. Like, I think that's just going to get harder to jump over, which is why I, and I feel like anxious about it sometimes. Like, I feel like, like now is the only time for my family over the next years or like next generations that like I'm going to have the easiest time right now, even though it's really hard to jump over this gap. So it feels like pressure on that front, but maybe I'm, I'm just getting too into the weeds on my own stuff that I think about. But yeah, I wish I had better, uh, better prospects to tell you. EV vehicles are worse for the earth than petrol fuel. Just look at what it takes to mine the battery metals. Then what happens when they become no good? What are we going to do with all of those batteries? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't have a good answer there. Josh says, look at what's happening in Toronto. The government is so hopelessly, hopelessly addicted to spending that they can't possibly consider cutting anything, holding programs, uh, raises, etc. So they are increasing taxes. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it's, it's tough, right? It's like the more and more you work, the more and more it feels like you're funding maybe governments that you don't agree with. Okay. Colin says, Rich, okay, either we uh, cut net migration or get real libertarian about a whole bunch of stuff real fast. We're on track for 200 million Canadians by 2075 and aren't building ghost cities. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. 
yeah, I feel you, AG. <laughs> I feel you. That's a, it's a, it's a tough situation. It is a tough situation. Okay, let's let's dive into some of this Taiwan stuff. Maybe this is interesting to you. Maybe it's not. Um, let me know. But after like all of this uh, interference stuff, I find really interesting. And I think that maybe a lot of people on the channel aren't as interested in it as I am. But I want to I want to check it out a little bit. Like oh, we have all of these allegations of interference in the in the 2019 election. This inquiry that's going to happen. This public inquiry. But a lot of people feeling sketched out about the person who's running it and whether or not it'll actually get to any positive outcomes or or actually any interference or if we'll learn anything or if everything's just going to be um, uh, everything's just going to be covered up. Right, like everything, not covered up like sketchily, but like uh, saying, "Hey, this security clearance nobody had. You can't make this stuff public. Um, we'd be offending our allies if we made this stuff public." I think that we're not going to learn a whole lot from that. But I found this interesting. The presidential election is on Saturday, but it has implications for Canadians. It's going to influence the timing of China's threat to annex Taiwan. Of course, they're saying Taiwan is where, when there was the, uh, the, the large war in China, where there were the current government overthrew the previous government, the previous government um, withdrew to Taiwan, and that's where they are now. Um, China, of course, always saying that Taiwan's not an independent state, it's just a part of China and we're going to invade it. They've been saying that for years and years and years. Um, they're saying that depending on what happens here, maybe this, is, this uh, invasion or reclaiming in, in China's view will happen sooner rather than later. But yeah, this is what I'm interested in. It reveals disturbing insights into the future of Beijing's voter interference in Canada. Um, yeah. Okay, let me see if I can get to the meat of this that I was checking out. Aha, here it is. Beijing openly wants the DPP displaced. This is one party in this election. The KMT to return to power, a little bit more favorable to Chinese interests. Last month, a senior Chinese uh, official chaired a meeting of the Chinese state party and agencies to support this. Uh, yes, the upshot, this is where it is. The upshot so far, lifelike computer fabricated videos depicting candidates saying things they never said and sort of spreading that. Carefully edited clips of politicians saying things in unguarded moments they wish they hadn't said. This is sounds familiar to the information that was um, shared about, was it Kenny Chu out, out in BC, um, who during the last election was largely inf interfered with through WeChat networks. Um, also, the creation of a network of Trojan horse fake social media groups purporting to support one party or another that spew fake scandals and conspiracy theories to discredit certain parties. The IA I know detects not only when the purchase was made, but when the person is actually reading it. Oh, if someone buys an ebook on Taiwanese politics. Wow, so they're like trying to learn more about the individuals who purchase those books. And then they are then micro-targeted with AI-generated messaging that undermines what they've just read. Huh. That's wild. So it's like, who is reading this ebook? And then let's send them all their stuff. Let's alter their algorithm so that they don't believe what they just read. Like, this is, this is the tough thing that I have with all of this is that like, I don't know what's true. Like, I talk about things here on the channel all the time, and I talk, and at the end of every video, I say, what have I gotten right? What have I gotten wrong? This is just what I am thinking about and how I'm thinking based on the information that I've consumed. That's the key note, right? Based on the information that I've consumed. Because I think that we all form these, these opinions and these thoughts over time. But it's all based on what we read, what we see, what we consume, and if we are consuming different things than one another, then of course we're going to have different opinions. And that's why I'll never, I'll never say, "Hey, you're you're an idiot for thinking something that I don't don't agree with," because I don't know that I'm right any more than you are on a topic, even if we completely agree uh, disagree on things, because we're both fed different information, right? There's no like communal sense of truth. Maybe there never was. Maybe we're just becoming more aware that nothing is nothing is true, nothing is verifiable, and maybe we, past, politi past populations were just able to, or were just unaware of the manipulation that was going on. But with the internet, I guess the ability to manipulate has, has gotten so much larger. So, 
yeah, that, that's, that's how I think about things. Like, I, I'm not confident in any of my thoughts or any of my beliefs because I don't know what is being fed to me. Maybe that's, like, crazy, like, matrix mind control conspiracy theory sounding stuff. But, yeah, I, I just don't trust any of the information that I read and that I consume. But I try my best to sift through it. And that's kind of the point of this channel is just to be one, one guy trying to sift through this stuff, make sense of this stuff. And maybe I'm got things ass backwards on, on a lot of things. But if I'm not going to talk about it and not going to have people tell me how wrong I am about something, then what's, then what's the point, right? Like, I think that that's more helpful to like, where are different people coming from? Nice. Skip those ads. Let's get a little bit more into it. With a crucial election around the corner in Taiwan, okay, candidates are at political extreme. rallies that's and events. That's why I'm not on stream. Oh, 1.5. Trying to win over voters. At the same time, there's another kind of campaign that's vying for influence here. Coming in a wave of propaganda and disinformation that experts say... Wait a minute, look at that. Is this like an AI-generated multiple frames of a video or like a video being sent out en masse, that's wild. Information that experts say is sweeping across the Taiwan Strait from mainland China. <laughs> it has watchdog groups here on high alert, <laughs> tracking coercive messaging online and finding signs of everything from Chinese musicians and influencers to AI and internet bots. They sort of prop up these more pro-China voices in Taiwan and claims that they are the true voices of Taiwanese public opinion. Maybe it's not aimed to change your behavior instantly, but it's about making you doubt more. Like online ads appearing to show Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen selling cryptocurrencies or the news that Taiwan is making biological weapons for the U.S. Officials say both are false. It's what experts describe as cognitive warfare, designed to sow division and weaken trust in Taiwan's leadership, mainly because Tsai's government favors independence, while China considers Taiwan an integral part of its territory that it one day plans to retake. Taiwan and China haven't held direct talks in nearly eight years. At the same time, Beijing has become adamant in its intentions, even if it means war. China has also increased shows of military force, with ships, surveillance patrols, fighter jets, even missiles becoming almost routine. Cyber attacks have soared too, according to Taiwan officials. There's now a Ministry of Digital Affairs with a well-known activist hacker, Audrey Tang, in charge. The reason why this information hurts is not because it will change the presidential election result, but because it will intensify uh, existing social conflicts. China denies any attempts at interference, but makes no secret of its preference for a government more aligned with Beijing. Taiwan, is Taiwan independence means war, said a spokesman in Beijing recently, adding independence is a dead end. Mar this is the wild thing like that I was just talking about. Like we're watching this NBC News. Oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Lost it. We're watching this NBC News broadcast and it's like, okay, they're obviously uh, coming at this from a very anti-China perspective. It's like how much of what they're saying is true. How much of what they're saying is false. Obviously China is one of the biggest competitors to the U S on the global stage. So it would make sense for an American media corporation to, to be, um, making them look bad however they can. Right. But at the same time, I don't like, I don't think I agree with a lot of the things that are going on in China. That's for sure. Yeah, but, like, is that just because I consume stuff like this? Like, I have such a hard time with this, and I don't know how anyone could be confident, so confident in their opinion that they would get mad at someone else for what they think, because I think it's all just so hard to sift through. Dependence is a dead end. Monitoring groups also point to what they call imelun, or U.S. skepticism, widespread messaging that questions U.S. reliability as an ally. In a speech at National Taiwan University captured by local media, the top U.S. diplomat here saying the U.S. stands with Taiwan. We believe it is for the Taiwan voters to decide their next leader free from outside interference. 
The skepticism, though, draws attention to U.S. involvement in Ukraine, Afghanistan, the Israel-Hamas conflict, and amplifies the idea that maybe the U.S. might not be there for Taiwan. The message is that there will be no knight in shiny armor to save you when things really go down. And that's why, in order to save yourself from that scenario, maybe you should befriend China right now so you will never get yourself into that situation in the future. Polls show a majority of voters don't favor closer ties to China or to the U.S. Instead, they want to preserve the status quo, with Taiwan's people deciding what's best for Taiwan. Janice Mackey Frere. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Like it. It's it, maybe I just say that too much, but yeah, it's gonna be wild to watch because I think it's gonna largely be something that we see in every single democracy. Like, I think the future of war and the future of conflict is so much less actual like military might and more like technological and like discourse altering warfare, right? Like. If you can make it seem like like the entire internet believes one thing, well, then that seeps into the real world and it changes the pressures on politicians. And like I don't know to what extent a, a reaction to a geopolitical event is genuine from the people who are impacted by it and actually reacting to it like that. Or like and how much of it is an amplification of maybe less consensus views that then become consensus views because the internet is being manipulated so heavily. Maybe that's a segue that definitely is for um, for this clip, which I saw, which kind of made me really sad. Maybe I'll just say it made me really sad to... Yeah. But this is wild. This was from uh, Olivia Chow in Toronto. The Toronto's mayor had like a public skate with me thing at Nathan Phillips Square. Everyone come out. Let's let's have a nice time and skate. And there were a lot of protests uh, going on um, with some elderly people getting involved with these protesters. Yeah, so the, the clip clip just made me sad. Like, I, like you can, like, I, you can. There's nothing wrong. Like, you can protest um, anything in public spaces. You can't assault people. Like, you can't do things that are illegal. But you can you can protest. I don't know what to think about all of this. Like, I honestly don't have a well formed view on any of this because of what I was talking about before. I don't know what I've consumed is true and what that I've consumed is false and what is state manipulation of of media to try to make me think one thing or to try to make the large larger canadian pol uh, population think one thing like it's wild i don't need i don't even know what to make of all of this and it's just me being honest i wish i could yeah i get that's the thing that made me upset like no ganging up on an elderly man is not ever okay yeah that I can I can agree with that, I can I can agree with that at the very least. Yeah, Fizz, <laughs> that's funny. Fizz, Fizz Shan says, uh, "What are you trying to make us think, though?" <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, don't no, don't trust me either. Don't trust me either. That's for sure. Um, I do my best to to talk about things from my perspective, but yeah, think about uh, 
how much you want to believe what I'm saying and how much you don't. Maybe I am a, a bot and paid for... <laughs> Maybe I'm AI. That would explain a lot to me. Maybe I'm just an AI simulation. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is funny. Yeah, Drawbot says, yes, he's a good AI generated, Russell. The best, in fact. Thank you. I'll take being the best AI. Oh, I, I passed the Turing test. Maybe I'm just so advanced that I've passed the Turing test. You mean well, says Random Pain. Yeah, appreciate you, Russell. Russell's takes have been pretty spot on. I don't know about spot on, but yeah, like I said, like I just am trying to sift through this stuff and talk about it with you all. And I appreciate you being here and chatting with me. And I hope we can do more of these live streams um, over this year. It's something I've always wanted to do. Oh yeah, one thing I want to talk about that I haven't uh, said on this live stream yet is uh, the shorts competition and sort of offer... Um, take this if you want to, don't, don't think about it a second time if you don't want to, but obviously you've seen a lot of the, um, the platforms the social media platforms really pushing short form content really heavily, right? I like making longer form YouTube videos, getting into a little bit more nuance of the conversations, right? Over 15 minutes, 20 minute videos, sometimes a little bit shorter. That's what I tend to do. Um, but I haven't gotten a lot into the short form content and there's been the start of people starting to take other people's content and, and clip it and um, some creators aren't really a big fan of that saying like, hey, you're making revenue off of my content, that's not fair. People sort of clipping things, I don't know if you've seen sludge content where there's like some other thing happening on the bottom of the screen and then another video of people talking on the top. But people will take other creators, some people think it's stealing, take other people's content and chop it up into shorts, short form content for those uh, those platforms, specifically for those platforms, making revenue on that content that maybe they didn't make, but they clipped and they made. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a di different approach. I don't often have the time, I'm, I'm trying to do it more and more. I don't often have the time to make my own shorts. So I'm gonna say, and I've said this in my previous video, anyone who wants to take any video from my channel through history or this stream or anything and chop it up and make a YouTube short or a TikTok, by all means, do it. And you can keep all of the revenue for it. Um, I'm not gonna have the opportunity to make shorts as, as much as I'd like to. So if you'd like to do that, take this content, create shorts out of it and post it, go for it. You can keep all the revenue. And at the end of the month, um, and hopefully at the end of each month if this works out, I'll reach out to the person who has the most viewed um, short from the content that I've made and they'll, I'll, I'll e-transfer them a hundred dollars just as a, as a thank you for making that, making that content. Yeah. I'm not going to copyright strike anything. I want people to, to share the content, share the messages in these videos. Um, I, I would ask though that you put some sort of tag uh, at Russell Matthews in uh, link to my TikTok or link to my YouTube uh, in, in the description and in the description do YouTube Russell Matthews on the videos that you're doing. Helps drive more people to the channel and I appreciate that. But like I said, any revenue that comes from the creation of these shorts is all for the, the person who makes the clip to, to, to keep. Um, so hopefully that works. Hopefully that's something that people are interested in. Uh, and maybe it might help people find the channel who don't know about it yet. So there's my little PSA about what we're starting to do here. Hopefully some people take me up on that. And who knows, maybe if there's some people that make some really good content, maybe I'll be able to work with them in the future or something like that to make short form content. Because, um, yeah, just, time is not the uh, most abundant resource in my life these days. But uh, it'd be awesome to have some short content. Okay. All right. I think we're going to start wrapping things up here on this stream, but uh, I always like to do a little bit of a Q&A or any other topics. I'm going to make uh, the chat a little bit bigger. Uh, what are you interested in? What are you talking about? Do you have any questions? You know, questions about the, being on YouTube, questions about Canadian economy, Canadian politics, macro politics. I'll give my, I'll give my take on anything, even if I don't fully understand it, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you that I don't understand it or what I don't know or what I'm not sure about. Thoughts on gold, says Pooter. Thoughts on gold. I've never been really drawn to it. 
I understand the feeling of like, okay, I want a hedge against the fiat system. Like the the, the dollars, they're not backed by anything. Uh, my dollars and my wealth are just going to get inflated away. Uh, so I understand that, that feeling. Um, I just haven't been really drawn to, to gold as that thing. Um, maybe it's the lack of productivity of the asset. Like if I'm going to own a real asset, I'd rather own uh, real estate that I can potentially rent out in a worst case scenario if I can no longer live there, that type of thing. I might think about more as a way to preserve wealth. But yeah, everything's speculation. You don't know where the markets are going to go. But if you can get a cash flowing property um, that covers all the expenses of the property in full, uh, mortgage, property taxes, interest, capital expenditures, that type of thing, I think that's a little bit better because it's a little more... Um, a little more productive as an asset and i also like because i'm in the weeds of it like i i do some work for different crypto companies and things like that uh i'm i'm in the deep in the crypto space so uh looking at bitcoin and, and ethereum are my main two like store of wealth assets store of value assets that's kind of my hedge against the fiat system more so than gold but i know lots of people are into it so Fizz Shan says, um, your take on Justin versus Polyev. I wonder if this is a, a Shannon I know, a Fizzle Thoughts. Um, interesting. But your take on Justin versus Polyev. Like, uh, I think that the majority of the country is saying, okay, there's a shelf life um, to politicians. And, and maybe there's too many people who blame Trudeau too heavily for for all of the issues in the country so much so that I think that they are not going to be willing to vote liberal again if he's the head of the party. I think that the liberals would may have a chance of winning the election again if they pivoted soon enough to switch. Um, do I think that Pit Polyev is the be-all, end-all and the, the savior that's going to solve everything in the country? Absolutely not. I don't think so. I think there's a lot of policies that I agree with. There's some that I disagree with. There's areas that I think he's not talking about things um, strategically um, so that he can't be held accountable to those things in the future. I think like some of his like thoughts on immigration and some of the more sensitive topics that um, could be used against him if you were to say um, things that are less popular. Um, I think he's not saying things about that. So it was to, so he can say to his base, hey, you don't really know. Just assume that I think the same thing as you. But at the same time, the liberals can't use stuff against him. So um, who knows? Uh, mm, 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 mm. If they can grow lab-grown diamonds, why can't they uh, grow a lab-grown gold? Yeah. Uh, there's a routine ad online, YouTube, of Elon Musk promoting an AI investment scheme. What's your thought on this, legit or not? I, not legit, not legit, Lisa, not legit. Uh, with deep fakes and things like that, there are so, so, so many, like of Kathy Wood or Jack Dorsey or these tech giants, um, Zuckerberg or, or Elon Musk, they, they either they take a previous pref, press conference and put it up, um, and then say in the description of the video, hey, you should buy this investment. And then it sounds like it's credible because it seems like these people are promoting it. Or it's just a deep fake entirely where it's AI who's that's generating the video and the voice to try to get you to invest in the scam. Uh, yeah, don't don't look at that too, uh, too seriously. It's mostly scams. Um, and I don't think that Elon Musk is going to uh, promote anything that you should invest in, especially on YouTube. Um, if you can't find like a financial post article about Elon Musk specifically talking about this specific investment, it's a total scam. So, so hopefully you haven't put your life savings in there, Lisa. I hope not. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Twila says, Russell, thank you for your critique, Re Polyev. I agree with you on everything you said, and I'm a lifelong conservative. I'm, I'm glad that you, you feel the same way. More talk about the Bitcoin ETF. These ETFs are the for the biggest asset managers in the world and opens the door to U.S. investors. Yeah, like the nice thing about Canada is that we've had um, not spot ETFs, I don't think, but we've had futures ETFs for quite a long time. 
uh, in Canada for crypto. So you've been able to hold um, centralized holdings of crypto in your tax advantaged accounts for quite a while. Oh, we have spot. Okay, Brewman, I'm I'm I could be wrong. I wasn't certain. That's cool. Obviously, the U.S. market's going to have a way bigger impact on price. Yeah. Wild. Okay, I'm going to do one last scan of Twitter here. Oh, you can see my mic. I thought I was out of the shot. Okay, whatever. One last scan of Twitter here. See if there's anything else going on that we should chat about. Obviously, the BTC ETF is the big, big news of the night. Cool. I think that's uh, about time to wrap it up, folks. I hope you've had a good night uh, just hanging out with me. I'm, uh, okay, last sip. Now we can call it a night. There we go. I hope you've had a good time. I hope you've um, enjoyed chilling here with me. Uh, interested what you think of these live streams. Obviously a more casual, relaxed sort of thing. I feel like you get a better idea of my actual personality and who I am from these streams than the, the edited videos. I try to be a little more concise, a little more to the point um, in those videos, but I love doing these streams because I get to actually chat with you and, and get to know you guys more personally as well. So hope you've enjoyed it. Hopefully we'll be able to do more of these throughout the year um, as the evenings permit when there's not a, a Leafs game on. <laughs> that's, actually, that's usually the main thing that stops me from doing live streams is because I'm watching hockey. Uh, man um, yeah Ho hopefully you guys enjoyed it subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so make some shorts if you want to um, and if it's something that you're good at and you're inter interested in um, Bruman says are you from Toronto I'm, I'm from just about a half hour east of Toronto in the suburbs so uh, thanks for tuning in everyone we'll do another one of these soon check out the most recent videos on the channel I appreciate you, you tuning in and uh, following along with uh, one guy trying to figure things out and, and sharing it along the way so have a great night. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye, everybody.